Well, good evening. It has been a blessed day, hasn't it? Amen. Amen. I tell you what, I love the Lord's Day where I can come together with my brothers and sisters in Christ and uh, have the fellowship we get to enjoy. And I love being able to come to a place such as this where I know that when I walk in, I'm greeted with uh, smiles and hugs and uh, all kinds of uh, good uh, things. And uh, just to know that fellow Christians across this land love you and uh, they love each other. And uh, what a great blessing. You know, we get to travel quite a bit, and uh, in our travels, we always meet a lot of uh, different people. And uh, I'm always uh, thrilled when I get to meet other Christians because we have so much in common. And the one thing we all have in common is that we all want to go to heaven, and we're all working toward that goal. Isn't that a blessing? And uh, just to be able to know that. I want to once again thank the elders here and Brother Jonathan for the invitation to be with you and uh, to be able to be on this lectureship. I've known of the lectureship for many years, but uh, this is my first time to be here, and I'm so thankful that I was able to come and be with you. And uh, I want to thank Jonathan once again for his uh, uh, putting the lecture together. You know, it takes a lot of work to put a lectureship together. I've put several together, and it's, uh, it's a lot of work. And he does a fantastic job with it, and we appreciate it very, very much. I also want to thank uh, Phil and his wife, uh, Becky Glover. See, you got that right, right? Glover? Well, I was close. Glover, Glover, you know. Tomato, tomato. Uh, but anyway, they took us out to uh, dinner today, and uh, we were going to go to the Legends, but it was going to be an hour waiting, and Phil was just too hungry to wait. So he took us to the Mexican place. <laughs> but we enjoyed that, and I appreciate them taking us out. Well, let's talk tonight about uh, the church and the home working together. We ought to realize this, if we think about the church and the home, that we as the church are a family. We're a family working together. And as a family, we ought to be concerned for each other. We ought to think about each other and what, uh, what we mean to each other. I know in my personal family, I grew up with uh, five siblings, six, count myself, five boys and one girl. My mom and dad had their hands full. But uh, as we grew up, my brothers and I, we would, uh, we would get in some scraps every now and then, as country boys do. And uh, it got to be known around the area that if you had to tackle one Skaggs boy, you might as well get ready for all of them because you're going to have to fight them all. And here's why. Because we were a family. And if you picked on one, you really picked on all of us. Now, I'm not suggesting you all do any fighting, all right? <laughs> I'm just telling you, with siblings, they take up for each other, right? They look out for one another. If someone picked on our sister, buddy, I want to tell you something. You were in trouble. You didn't pick on her. And she knew it, too. And she took advantage of it also. <laughs> but that's what families do, right? Families stick together. Well, if we would start thinking in terms of that as a church, we recognize that as a church, we are a family. The one thing I told uh, my children, try to teach them, was that the church really was the most important family that you have. Your other family, that is your physical family, it's secondary to the church. I love my children. I love my siblings. I love my mother. My father's passed on. I loved him. But uh, the fact of the matter is, those are secondary to the family of God. The family of God is more important as a family than any other family. And if we begin to recognize that, we begin to understand that if we understand that concept and if all of our siblings understand that, then we'll all be on the same page and there'll be a great love for each other. And we can do great things together when that happens. Remember that we're the family, as Paul said, Romans chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. It said, the Spirit bears witness to our spirit that we are the children of God. 
And if children, then heirs, and we're joint heirs with Christ Jesus. We are the children of God, and so we ought to act like the children of God. The church must help those in the home, and likewise, the home must help the church. The Bible says that we are co-workers together. At least that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you that you receive not the grace of God in vain. We are workers together, co-workers. That, mean we are, that means we are working side by side with each other, as the family ought to. And we're working side by side with each other. We are looking out for each other. We're concerned about each other as we work together. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 and verse 10, Paul goes on to say, For we are laborers together with God. You're God's husbandry. You're God's building. According to the grace of God was given unto me as a wise master builder. He says, I've laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Paul says the foundation has been laid, and we have come along, we have built upon it. Someone else has come along and built upon it. Others have come along and built upon it. And I recognize that that is still ongoing today. The foundation has been laid. You and I, we are building upon the foundation, and there are others who have gone on before us who have already been building on that, and we're building on their works as well. I do not assume that I'm so important that I can build something without the help of others. If I did assume that, I would be wrong. All of us need to recognize the great men and great women who went on before us and how the work that they've done has brought us to where we're at today and be thankful of what they've done, but at the same time to recognize that we're still building. We're having, we haven't stopped. It's still an ongoing thing. And we need to work together to build together as God would have us to do. As we work together, God, surely we can understand that we're to work together with each other. We are to build each other up in the most holy faith. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, he says, and edify each other, even as also you do. And then in Romans 14, verse 19, Let us therefore follow out the things that make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. And I know we've talked about edifying earlier this week. But they understand this concept here that we need to recognize that we need to be building each other up, and that's what edify means. To build one another up in the most holy faith. There's nothing greater that we'll ever do than building each other up in the most holy faith. And that's something we all need to take serious about, isn't it? The church and the home work together as we do those things together. For the church and the home to work together, there are some things which we as a church must understand, and there are some things that we as a family must understand also. One of those things is this. We must understand that every member is important. Drive at home just a moment, all right? Every member is important. There is not a member of the body of Christ, whether in this location or any place else, that is not important. We need to understand that. I don't know that we really have ever really fully grasped that to the degree that we really need to. But we need to, don't we? One of the most crucial things that we can do in the overall work of the church is to help Christians understand their immense value to the overall work of the church. For instance, the young man who led songs this evening, I'll tell you what, that is a fantastic job of leading songs. For such a young man to have such control over leading songs, he ought to be praised in that and, and lifted up. Not the point that we fill his head with pride, but lifted up the point he understands that he is appreciated. And the older brother who led songs this morning, I'll tell you what, that was just absolutely, those songs touched my heart this morning. 
As he was reading, leading the song with Brother Tittle, I, I couldn't help but think about, I was able to meet Brother Tittle at his last birthday, 101 years old. And as he's leading that song, I, I, could, I could almost hear Brother Tittle singing that song and, and the, the beauty of those words. And as he led that song, I'm thinking, man, that's, that build him up, you see? Strengthen each other, build each other up. That's what we need to be doing as Christians and encourage each other. You know, many families might feel as if uh, they've left, been left behind. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like I, I'm just, I'm nobody and, and uh, I, I'm, I'm not important? Have you ever felt that way? Well, I have. I believe we've all admitted we probably all have at one time or another, right? Sometime in our life, we've probably, in our life, we probably felt like I, I'm, just, I'm just insignificant. But the fact of the matter is, we're all very significant. We're all very important. And we need to help each other understand those things. On several occasions, Paul taught us how that every part of the body is important. In the text that was read, and you're hearing this morning, this evening rather, in uh, Romans chapter 12, in uh, verses 3, they're following through 8, and then uh, let, listen to what he says here, begin in verse, uh, well, let's look where we begin reading. Romans chapter 12. He says, uh, so we, verse 5, so we being many are one body in Christ, and everyone, what's this here, members one of another. Having then di gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us, whether prophecy let us prophesy, or according to the portion of faith, or minister, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teaches on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. To get the idea that he's talking to different members who have different gifts, and the idea that they're to use those particular gifts to the glory of God. And he's saying here in this sense here, these gifts are given to everyone. I believe here in this context he's talking about the miraculous, but understand this here, the concept is here with us today, that there are gifts or talents that every one of us have. You may never be able to preach a gospel sermon. That may not be your talent. You may never be able to lead singing as the young man did this evening. That may not be your talent. And that's all right. It may be that the Lord blessed you financially real well and you give real well to the church. And that's a blessing, isn't it? That's one of the blessings that God has given you and has given that to you that you might use it to His glory that we might come together as a whole, every one of us, doing what we can do to bring glory to God in the church. That's what every family can do to look at their own talent and say, what can I do for the overall work of the church? Where can I use my talent at? And then for elders, leaders, to be able to look out to every family and look within those families and find out what talent those families have and mesh those things together and use them to the glory of God. That's what we need to be doing, right? That's how we work together in using the talents God has given us because we're all important. In like manner, Paul uses another analogy over in in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, one of my favorite of all of his uh, analogies of the human body as he describes the functions or the function of the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, he begins, well, let's pick up in verse 12. He says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are yet one, so also is Christ. For by one Holy Spirit, where we're all baptized in one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, have, have been made all to drink into one spirit. 
Now watch what he says here in verse 14. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the foot, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the ear shall say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now if God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it pleased him. And if they were all one members, then where were the body? But now there are many members, yet one body. And what's this? The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the foot, I have no need of thee. Nay, much more of these members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And these members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncommonly parts have more abundant commonness. For our common parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that which lacketh, that there should be no schisms in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffers, all members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. You know, when I read that, I, I get it. I understand what Paul was talking about. And, and Paul might have even been thinking about his own physical body. Have you ever thought about that? You know, Paul had gone through some uh, terrible things. He had been beaten. He had been shipwrecked, left dead. I imagine his body, and well, I know his body, it bore some marks of the cruel treatment that he received at the hands of so many who wanted to destroy Christianity. And don't you know that his body suffered and that he tended to his own body? I remember when I was about 14, maybe 13, somewhere along that line, we owned a farm back in Missouri, and my dad at that time did custom bailing and haying. And uh, I'd been out in the field and had stuck a stob. Y'all know what a stob is, right? If you don't, I'll explain it to you later. But I stuck a stob in my foot, you know. And, and uh, boy, I'll tell you what, I, I milked that for all it's worth. I mean, I, I got out of work, you know. And uh, working the farm was hard. So I got, I got out of work and I was hobbling around with a makeshift crutch, you know acting like I was really hurt. And uh, my dad had just sharpened the mower. And you know those old arms, you, you, you slid the, 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 the sickle back up into the arm and you could raise the arm up, you know, on the mower. Well, the arm was still laying down. And I came out of the garage and about the time I started to hop over the sickle, my dad said, son, don't do that. He says, you'll cut your toe off. Well, I was already in the motion, and lo and behold, I tripped, and my toe was hanging by the thread. I mean, just the skin on the bottom, you know. And my dad grabbed me up and uh, grabbed a towel and stuck the toe back together, you know, and wrapped it all up and run me into the old bone doctor, Dr. Stoll. The thing I remember about Dr. Stoll more than anything else was that'll be $5. But, uh, <laughs> that's back in the day. <laughs> but Dr. Stoll, he looked at it and he said, uh, well, Johnny, he says, uh, you want me to cut it on off or sew it back on? I said, sew it on, Doc, it's my toe. <laughs> I knew this, that that toe was part of me, and I wanted it where it belonged, back on my, part of my toe, you know, sewed together. I didn't realize until later how important the toes were and you're balancing things, but they play an important part. But nonetheless, though, I wanted that toe there because it belonged to me. It was part of my body. And the rest of my body was running to its rescue. Had a mule, I mean, not a mule, but a, 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 a bull throw me off one time riding. Broke my arm. 
And don't you know I went around with a broken arm just said, hey, it's, not, it's all right, you know? No, we set the arm. You see, your body, my body come to rescue that, right? When you get sick, do you go to the doctor and say, Doc, I, I need a pill, I need something to, to fix me, or do you just continue on being sick? Well, your body runs to rescue, doesn't it? Well, that's what Paul is saying here as he makes this analogy about between the, uh, the human body and the body of Christ. And he says every part in the body of Christ is just like your body, your physical body, it is important. I have things inside my body that I don't even know, have never seen, couldn't have pronounced their name, but I know they're there and I know they belong to me. I want them to stay where they belong because they serve a function in my body, whether I know it or not. And the same thing is true with the body of Christ. The foot can't say to the hand, I don't need you. The hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. The ears can't say to the mouth, I don't need you. We need everyone, don't we? That's the point that Paul is saying. We're all important in the body of Christ. And we need to realize just how important we really are. And come to the rescue of each other when we find ourselves in trouble. Those who start, who are not strong ought to help the weak as a family so we can be sensitive to the needs of other family members. Paul said this in Romans 15, verse 1, verse 2. We then who are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves lest every one of us please his neighbor, neighbor of his own if it's good to advocation. Romans 12, 1 and 2. A good case study of this is found in Acts chapter 6. You remember the Grecian widows? They were being neglected in the ministry. And the apostles, they appointed 12 men to take care of the Grecian widows. And the Bible says, as these are taken care of, and the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. Acts 6, verse 7. And when we do likewise, the same result will be. When we take care of each other as a church and as a family, when we come to help each other in our needs, great things will, be, will take place because of that. That is, we'll be able to see great results because of it. The church will grow, families will grow, and God will be glorified in what we're doing. Secondly, the church and home working together must realize this, that the church and home must be united. We must be united. Over the years, one thing I've seen that's hindered the church and the home from being able to do all that it could do is the lack of being united together. One of the problems in the first century church was division. Paul had been written to and told that there were some problems going on in the church, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 11 through uh, 13, remember what Paul said? For it has been declared unto me of the house of Chloe that there are contentions among you, says. And this I say that every one of you saith, I'm a Paul and I'm a Cephas, uh, I'm a Paulus and I'm a Christ. He says, Is Christ divided? He says, Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in my name, he says? In essence, Paul says, is saying, why are you following after men? And that was a problem, wasn't it? They were following after men, and then he goes on to tell them in chapter 3 that here's the real problem. They were carnal and not spiritual. He says, chapter 3, verse 1, 2, and 3. And I, brother, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. For even as babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. There hinder too, you were not able to bear it, neither yet are you now. For you are yet carnally, says, for as there is envy among you and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? That is, as worldly men is what he's saying. You're not walking after Christ. You're walking after men. 
And because of that, it's causing problems within the body of Christ, and you're not united, so you cannot do the work that you need to be able to do. Well, the church and family have got to come together and be united, don't we? We've got to realize the unity that we need to have within the body of Christ and even within our families. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. Paul reminds us once again, For we are laborers together with God. You're God's husbandry. You're God's building. We're, we're building together. And we need to learn to build together. Elders and preachers and members ought to be sensitive to the needs of others. They should ask themselves something of this nature. Are we being spiritual in these matters or are we being carnal in these matters? Why is it that we're upset about this particular thing or that particular thing? Is there a real reason for it, or are we just being carnal in our thinking? And if we are, then we need to make adjustments, don't we? Wise men of old understood this concept of unity, and they wrote about it, about the important part that it plays in one's life. David said this in Psalms 133 and verse 1 and 2. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Then he goes on to say, It is like the precious ointment upon the head, even the head of Aaron that ran down the beard, even Aaron's beard. They went down to the skirts of his garments. Can you imagine that scene? As oil was poured upon Aaron, and how it run down his beard and run down his garments. And it says it was precious ointment. That meaning this area, it was very costly ointment. But he said, and that's what unity is like. It's costly and it's precious. We ought to recognize just how precious it really is. Solomon said this here, this in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 and verse 10. Two are better than one. Behold, they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him again. Again, he says, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. I understand that, don't you? You know, uh, we often had to pull something, and uh, if you get a little string and try to pull a car with another car, what's going to happen? It's going to break, right? But if you take that little string and you wind it together with another piece of string, and then you wind that together with another piece of string, and another piece of string until you have a good solid rope, will you break it? Not hardly, right? Even more difficult, isn't it? When we work together, it's great, isn't it? You know, after we got tired of being in the hay fields, my dad got in the logging business. I traded one hard work for a more difficult hard work. <laughs> and uh, us boys, we would have to go to the log woods with dad. And uh, we didn't have the fine equipment that they have today. We worked behind two old mules, Jack and Betsy. Now, Betsy was named after my sister-in-law. But, uh, but anyway, these two old mules, they were hard-working mules. And they could do a lot. But uh, they could do a whole lot more when you hooked them together. And they began to pull together. There was so much difference in what they could do. I remember on one occasion, Dad got the log truck high-centered on a stump and uh, tried to get uh, one of the mules to pull it off, and it couldn't do it, so he hooked both the mules together, and guess what? It was just like they just walked off with it, like it wasn't nothing there at all. And the one mule was just straining and straining and straining, could not do it, but when both of them got together, it was just like an, it was just so easy. And that's the same thing with us in the church. When we work together, right? When we pull together, we're all on the same page, then we can do great things, can't we? 
I recognize that all unity is not healthy. You know, Numbers, the 13th chapter, you remember there were 10 who were united together to not go in and take the land of Canaan. That wasn't healthy. They were in rebellion against God, saying, oh, we, we can't take it. And because of their rebellion, you recall that all those of age of 20 and above who came out of Egypt died in the wilderness because of that rebellion, save Jacob or Caleb and Joshua. That wasn't a good, healthy unity, was it? But I remember another occasion where the children of Israel came together to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem under the leadership of Nehemiah. And here's what the Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6. So built we the wall, it says, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof. And here's why. For the people had a mind to work. They were united together. All of them. They all did their own part. And because they all did their own part, they being united together, they were able to build the wall together of Jerusalem. What a great work that was. And so if we work together as they did and build the walls of Jerusalem, what remarkable things will, carry, will we be able to carry out for the cause of Christ? There are great things that we can do, isn't there? But it's all working together. Remember Paul said, Romans 14, 19, Let us therefore fall out of things that make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another, working together, building each other up in the most holy faith. Thirdly, the church at home must recognize that there is a work to do. We often sing the song, I'm sure you do here, to the work, to the work, to the work. That's an old song. When we sing that song, do we believe that? Do we believe there's a work? Do we believe we must get on with doing the work? Or do we just sing the song that really means nothing? Well, there's a great work to do. The work of the church involves the home working together in harmony with the church as we carry out the will of God. I believe that you can summarize the work of the church in one phrase, and that is saving souls. And as Brother Sam pointed out this morning, it's involved in three different areas. Evangelism, advocation, and benevolence. And we all need to be working together in those areas to evangelize, to edify, to do good to others. We can do that, can't we? Evangelize. Do you realize that not only do we need to evangelize the lost, but even those within homes need to be evangelized, right? As a church, we need to be going and looking into the homes and making sure that we're fulfilling the Great Commission, even in the homes of individuals that we know. We need to evangelize, get on doing the work that we need to be doing. Then we need to be edifying each other, to building each other up, right? That's a lifelong work to build each other up. We also need to be helping each other in benevolent works, which is strive together to make sure that local families are taken care of when it comes to benevolence. And I know, I know that sometimes you think, well, there are people out there who take advantage. And I know there is. But don't let people who take advantage stop you from doing the work that God intended for us to do. Those who take advantage of us, they'll have to answer God for that. But we'll have to answer God if we don't help others who, are really, who really need help. You know, one thing that I, as you're reading the Bible, you come across things that are, that are uh, interesting. Here's one phrase that I remember what Paul said. You know, Paul was given the right hand of fellowship from, from Peter and James and John as a race of ministry to the Gentiles. And they ask him this one thing, they said to him. And here's what he says. He says, the only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I was also afford to do, Galatians 2, verse 10. Of all the things that the apostles could have said to Peter or Paul, this one thing is what they said. We would that you would remember the poor that you would help the poor. 
And if you'll read through Paul's letters, that's the one thing that he continually did. He was getting up funds and delivering funds from different churches to help the poor saints who were in need. I always found that interesting of all the things they could have said. Later, Paul would write this here in Galatians 6, verse 10. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially the household of faith. There's much work to do. And we as a church and we as a family need to come together to do the work that God has set down for us to do. As you think about this work, think about this. The only way you could ever work with the church and with the family in doing the work of the church is number one, to become a member of the church. If you're not a member of the church, you can't help the church. You can sit on the sidelines and you can be a good person, you can do good things, but you'll never benefit the church until you become a member of the church. On the day of Pentecost, after that great sermon was preached, they cried out, being pricked in hearts, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, Acts 2, verse 38. And those who did, about 3,000, were added to the church daily, such as should be saved, verse 47 of Acts 2. If you have not done that, why not tonight do that? Why not put Christ tonight on in baptism? And when you do, the Lord will add you to His church. Perhaps you have done that and you have strayed away and you have no benefit to the church when you have strayed away. It's time to come home, isn't it? We've all had to make that decision one time or another in our life to recognize that it's time to come home. I wrote a book several years ago called The Way Home. And actually, it's about my life coming back out of the world of drugs and, uh, and alcohol and ungodly things, how I came back out of that life and came home, the way home. We need to come home, don't we? Come home that we may help you, that may build you up in the most holy faith while together we stand and while we sing.